Yeah, I always call myself amateur health guru. Um, I don't know anything, but I know a lot is kind of <laughs> what I find myself doing. And I've been on a journey for most of my life, but especially the last 10 years of just looking for what is health? What does good health feel like and look like? And what should I expect? And when I began digging into this a number of years ago, um, I went down the rabbit hole of discovery of, wait, most of what we're told seems to have come from places that I'm not so sure I can trust in, um, which I again imagine many of your listeners are very used to kind of thinking that way. And I just kept digging and digging and digging. And I'm learning to share, you and I had a conversation beforehand about sharing transparently and mm-hmm. being you know, vulnerable. And so I'm learning to share what I'm good at. And the thing that I've got good at as this amateur health geek is maybe because I'm not a specialist, because I don't have a health qualification, I don't do health for a living. Maybe it helps me be sort of wider in my view and quite open-minded. And even in the, let's say, more innovative, um, different ways of looking at health, the kind of the people that you would follow and I would follow and would follow you and so on, there's still natural specializations within it. And the thing I've got quite good at is looking at a really wide picture sometimes because I know quite a lot about quite a lot across physical, mental, spiritual health. Sometimes I see something that nobody else sees. But turning that into a mirror and looking at yourself, that's the most challenging. So if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I'd have said, you know, I'll put myself in the top one or 5% of the things I do for my health, however one chooses to measure it but I actually started to discover about a year or two ago that maybe I wasn't getting the results that would put me in the top one to 5%. I was in the top 20 or 50 or whatever it might be. I looked well, looked pretty lean and pretty muscular and healthy and in many ways seemed great. And I'd come a long way with my physical health and my mental health, but there were some huge gaps or issues. I had a number of major health incidences. I ended up in hospital too many times for someone that's apparently the healthy guy. (laughs) <laughs> and I went down the usual route of, I must be missing something. There's something in my diet. There's a quirk in my genetics. There's a, whatever else it might be. And I'm trying to plug every little hole I can until eventually I turned the mirror around and said, there's something else here. This, the one little gap in one vitamin isn't going to be the thing. This is too big. And you know how to look after yourself. Uh, and through a quirk of circumstance and luck, and coincidence, which I don't actually believe in anymore. <laughs> I have too many coincidences for them to be coincidences. I came across some work um, from Dr. John Sarno um, and a bunch of other people in the, let's call it alternative mental spiritual health place like Joe Dispenza and Gabor Mate and so many people that maybe have slightly different modalities, but I'd put them in a similar category. All these people that kind of say you might be missing how much your thoughts, your unconscious thoughts, your conscious thoughts, your mental stability and state has on your physical state and your physical well-being. So yeah, I had this horrible sounding, well, actually not so horrible sounding, but this horrible thing called complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS. I had osteoarthritis in my big toes because I'd run five half marathons back to back a number of years ago, having not trained enough for it and had all sorts of problems, couldn't run anymore, et cetera. I lived in Austin, Texas, the allergy capital of the planet, where everyone's going to get major allergies all the time. And that was me. And and all these things kept happening and getting worse and worse and worse. And one day I'm sat reading a Dr. Sano book and this guy's stuff, and this is me being layman because I am so layman. Basically he says, right, I'm, this is back in the seventies, I'm a neck and back doc, surgeon, et cetera. People come into me and we do a surgery because they've got a herniated disc, whatever it might be, and there's pain there, and we fix them. And then I keep noticing they get better, but then they get worse again. And then I've noticed that just as many people come in that have the same pain without that herniated disc. And then I start to notice there's a bunch of people out there walking the streets with that same herniated disc with no physical problems whatsoever. I'm not so sure we've got this right. So I'm reading that thinking, yeah, I'm a bit mistrusting of a lot of modern medicine. And I'm a bit mistrusting of maybe we think we're addressing causes, but we're still really addressing symptoms. This is speaking to me. 
So he goes on to say that he did more and more research and started to test stuff out. Started with necks and backs because that was his speciality, but it eventually went into all sorts of pain and other ailments. And he noticed a pattern and he developed a theory. And the theory was that we all have unconscious, buried, he called it rage, could be trauma, upset, whatever negative connotation of a word you want to put in there. And it's emphasizing the point unconscious. So it's not the conversation that we have with ourselves. It's not the voices in our head. And by the way, anybody claims they haven't got a voice in their head, they're the ones that made me <laughs> nervous. I've got loads. Um, but it's the stuff that we don't talk about because we're not aware of it. It's deep, deep down. Like I'm pointing at the back of my neck or even down in my kind of my stomach, my gut. It's the stuff that's going on way back from when I was six. A particular moment that happened that doesn't have to be big, scary trauma that you read about where you think, oh my God, I can't believe somebody went through that. It could just be my interpretation at six years old of a particular minor situation that I processed in a much more negative way and that got locked in. And that stuff's in there. So we've all got stuff. I don't believe there's a human on the planet that hasn't got stuff from childhood and ongoing life. But I think what starts to happen is sometimes that stuff starts to want to come out into the conscious mind. And I think, this is now my theory, that we as a species have developed very quickly in this last million years, almost too quickly. We've got some weird stuff. We, I mean, many of your listeners would be very mindful of the principles, like we're all caught in this fight and flight today. So things happen today that shouldn't be big and scary, but because we've still got this lizard brain that was used to being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger and had to survive, et cetera, we overreact to certain things. Because we've all so fast, we haven't caught up yet. Now, maybe in a million years, we might have calmed that down. The fight and flight response might change, but we are where we are. So our brains start to sense that maybe some unconscious upsets, traumas, rage from childhood wants to sneak out into our conscious. Let's call it pain. And our brains think we can't cope with it. So it goes, oh, no, this is not going to be good. He, Daniel won't know what to do with this thing from when he was six. I need to distract him. So it causes physical pain or some other ailment as a distraction. Now, even as I'm saying it, and I've been through life-changing stuff, and I've helped other people have the same experiences, I can almost hear, hear the woo-woo mumbo jumboness <laughs> of it. But at the end of the day, I'm the evidence, and the people around me have become the evidence. So I'm just going to keep going if that's okay. Um, so we, we produce a pain. Now, our brains are clever. It will try and put a problem where it's most believable to us. So if you have said slipped disc or herniated disc, or in my case, well, I had all this inflammation from running five half marathons and look at my toes, or with my complex regional pain syndrome, which was in my ankle, I'd sprained my ankle a number of times, I even had an x-ray and an MRI where the, the analyst said, oh, if you sprained your ankle, I can see all this old tissue damage, et cetera. It's my brain going, let's put the problems where he'll, it'll be believable, where he can have an X-ray and he'll find the evidence to support it to help him go, oh, well, that must be it then. Because if I accept that prognosis, I accept that pain, that issue, that illness, whatever it might be, then the distraction has worked. My brain can go, phew, this thing from six years old won't come up anymore. He's too busy, focused on the agony in his ankle. And I mean agony. I was writhing around, mm. crying in pain at times. And I'm, I'm the more common, like many guys are more like, oh my God, with pain, you don't cry so much. This was tears rolling on my face kind of pain. Scary shit. Um, and it was working. It was distracting. And he believes that, Asana believes, and many proponents of this kind of thinking believe that this can go beyond just pain issues, but it goes into all sorts of autoimmune diseases, maybe in some situations, cancers, heart disease, all sorts of other things, could be brought on by the brain. And the term psychosomatic, I misunderstood. I thought that many imagined. It doesn't. It means brought on by the brain. The thing is real, but what's the real cause? So your listeners are now thinking, where's this guy going? Well, here's where I'm going. I got two thirds of a way into the first Sarno book that I read. And I'm sat there reading it thinking, he's talking about me. Everything he's describing in terms of personality type and history sounds like me. The person doing all the right physical things, but not getting the right physical results. And I'm looking down at my ankle thinking, this burning agony I've got, it's very believable. Sprained ankle, history. One of my kids had the same disease once, which is like, mm -hmm. so it was on my radar. It all makes mm -hmm. sense. 
I was having a good day. It wasn't hurting much that day. I used to have flare-ups that would come and go. And I don't know what happened, but I just sat there and thought, I, I buy it. I don't buy that this is the real deal. I need to go and test it. So I literally put my clothes on, go into my gym. I've got a gym in my garage. And I think, right, I'm going to lift some weights. I'll take it easy. And I thought, no, hang on a minute. He talks a lot about the fact that if I'm taking it easy, it's because I don't really believe that this is a mental issue if I believe it's physical. So I have to go for it. So I literally pick up the heaviest things I ever lift in the gym (laughs) and specifically pick exercises that put tons of weight on the legs, the ankle, and so on. And I start working out and I'm fine. Okay, well, I've been fine before. And then I've had a flare up. And about five minutes in, I get this twinge in my ankle. And that twinge used to mean you've got about three or four minutes, Daniel, to get to the sofa before your ankle kind of explodes in agony and you are you're done for the next two days. And I looked in the gym mirror back at my ankle and I just burst out laughing. I was like, no way. No. <laughs> and I actually said, F off out loud. Mm. And it went. And I giggled in a bit of an uncomfortable childlike way, carried on working out. Maybe 10 more minutes later, it did it again. It's like it went, oh, I'm going to try again. I'm worried that he's on to me. It flared for a millisecond. I'm like, no, no. This time I was more polite. I said, thank you. I'm good. And it went away. Long story short, 14 months on, I've never had a flare up of CRPS ever again. This thing is supposed to be incurable. I cured it in a moment. And then my journey over the following six months, which could get a bit roughly, so we'll just skip it, was fix the toes, and I'll run again, um, fix the seasonal allergies, the exploding feels like the flu kind of thing, gone. number of other ailments cleared up, all because I simply accepted the principle that physical issues were coming because of my brain worrying about me not coping with pain. And just uncovering that possibility, believing in that being the case, was actually enough to fix most of my stuff. Mm. I actually didn't even have to go into the psychological piece of what is my stuff? What happened at six? What happened at 10 or 12 or whatever to fix it? Now, with some stuff, I did then go a stage further, which I can come back to, but it just astounded me as the physical health guru that this could have that big an impact. And then since then, I've helped a number of other people have similar breakthroughs. A friend who was about to have complete like shoulder replacement surgery is fine now. Completely fine. Because he read some books, listened to some podcasts, and had a chat. 